Today on Blue 58, woof. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Muirdink, joining you after a very disappointing loss to the Los Angeles Chargers, to say the least. This was not great. And before we get too far, I would like to remind you that this podcast is sponsored in part by Ticket King. If you want to see if the Packers can get off the schneid next week against the Carolina Panthers and do it in person, why not check out a Wisconsin-based ticket broker? Head to theticketking.com or click the tickets link at thepowersweep.com to find tickets for the Packers next home game. The Chargers had an answer for everything the Packers wanted to do on offense in this one and were able, it seems, to exploit just about every weakness the Packers seem to have on defense. Got to hand it to the Chargers in this one. They seemed really on top of everything that they wanted to do. This seemed like a team that was really, really in tune with what they are as a football team. And that's an important thing to be, especially if you're coming into a game three and five on the brink of losing control of your season. The Packers came in looking a little bit like they were reading their own press clippings a little bit. And I don't want to get too far into the they were unprepared storyline, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the Packers look like they expected to win this one, and the Chargers looked like they did as well. The difference was they were doing everything that they possibly could to ensure that outcome by taking advantage of the Packers' weaknesses, and the Packers just weren't able to press on the Chargers' weaknesses at all. So why did this happen? We're not going to do that in this particular episode. Usually we try to break down two or three big reasons, more broad stroke reasons why this outcome may have occurred. In this one, I feel like we've got a pretty good idea why we got the outcome that we did. The Chargers ran the ball well. They targeted the short to intermediate middle of the field in their passing game. And they made life miserable for Aaron Rodgers with minimal pass rushers, which has generally been the book on Aaron Rodgers dating back to like 2011 or so. If you can get to Aaron Rodgers rushing just three or four guys, you've got a really good chance of having a successful afternoon against him. And that's what the Chargers did in this one. Instead of doing that, we're going to play a game popularized by Scott Van Pelt and Ryan Rossillo on their radio program back when that was still a thing on ESPN radio, uh, taking an aspect of a, a particular game or a league or whatever and asking one question, is this a headline or is it a story? Basically, is this just something people are talking about because it sounds good or is there some actual uh, fire to this smoke? Sound good? Good. Let's start with, with one big kind of narrative related item. The idea that this could be a good loss for the Packers. I think this is just a headline because I don't think there's any such thing as a good loss ever. Every loss that you put on your record takes you farther away from your ultimate goal of winning the Super Bowl. And even if it's just a question of positioning, there could be consequences long term for a loss like this. I think back to the Packers 2014 season. Late in the year, they had a loss on the road to the Buffalo Bills. It was a game they probably should have won. Even if one play went differently in that game, it might have changed the entire complexion of the game. I think of Jordy Nelson inexplicably dropping a, a deep ball uh, from Aaron Rodgers that it looked for all the world like he could have taken in for a touchdown. That might have changed that entire game because it was a pretty low-scoring affair. Ultimately, that loss cost the Packers home field advantage in the playoffs. And as a result, they ended up playing a particular championship game on the road when they could have played it at home. And changing just that one factor of that game against the Seattle Seahawks, I think the Packers probably walked their way into the Super Bowl in 2014. But that loss against the Buffalo Bills meant that they were playing in Seattle instead. You could spin a lot of that game against the Bills the same way a lot of people are going to talk about this game for the Packers. 
gave them an opportunity to refocus. It exposed some weaknesses that they can work on and help them get back on track by just giving them a wake-up call. All of those things. And some of those things may be true, but that doesn't mean this was a good loss, a character-building loss or, or anything. There are no moral victories in the NFL. There is no style points is a line I've used a lot this year. Well, there aren't any moral victories either. It's a zero-sum game. Some people win, some people lose. And the Packers lost today. There's nothing to take away from it positive. And I mean, other than, you know, the scouting and, and things like that. But there's no there's no character building aspect to this that I'm ever going to buy. There's no such thing as a good loss. And saying that is just a, a headline. It's not a real story. Similar to that, I, I think this idea that the Packers were unprepared is going to be a headline as opposed to an actual story. I don't know how you could say that they're actually definitively unprepared. This sounds like water cooler sports talk radio nonsense talk. The Packers were unprepared in this one. Did they look a little flat at times? Sure. But you got to give some credit to, to the guys on the other side too. A big reason the Packers looked flat on offense early on is because the Chargers were getting a heck of a lot of pressure on Aaron Rodgers. A lot of offenses are going to look flat if your quarterback is getting consistently pressured. To me, it didn't look like the Packers were necessarily unprepared for what the Chargers did as well as much as the Chargers were just well prepared for what the Packers were going to do. They were prepared to take advantage of the way the Packers blocked. Uh, they were double teaming uh, the slot receivers, which is something that uh, even Tony Romo pointed out. The Packers have had a lot of success there. The Chargers were prepared for what the Packers did well. And further, it seems like no success the Chargers had was because of anything new about the Packers' defense. All of the problems that cropped up for the Packers in this game seem to have been known issues. And we'll touch on those in, in a second. But it wasn't like the Packers could have really just prepared harder to overcome some of these things. They're still going to have a lot of the same limitations with this team that they had last week or two weeks ago or a month ago or at the start of the season because they haven't changed the complexion of their team in the meantime. How do you prepare to overcome the physical shortcomings of a middle linebacker who seems to be un unable to cover tight ends over the middle? I don't know how you prepare around that. It's just a, a reality of the, of the game of one Blake Martinez. And we'll touch on that in a second too. I don't, I don't think this was a preparation issue. I think it was just the Packers not being able to take advantage of the, the Chargers' weaknesses because of the Chargers utilizing their strengths. And that's why you play the games. Coming out of this one, though, we are going to see the headline that the Packers can't stop the run again. And I think this is definitely a story to watch over the remainder of the season. The Packers have seemingly no answer for anybody's run game anymore other than trying to get way out in front as early as they can and hoping that they can't pass their way back into the game and as to why that is I don't know if I can really answer that from a scheme perspective but as we were talking about in the previous little section here personnel wise we may have some clues I think the Packers are weaker with run stopping interior defensive linemen than they've been in the past few years this is where I think you miss a guy like Mike Daniels a little bit I thought Kingsley Kiki, Kiki would be playing a bit more of a role by this point in the season. He, he hasn't. And as a result, you just have Kenny Clark, who can't play every single play, Montrevious Adams and Tyler Lancaster. I'm not grouping Dean Lowry in there so much as, uh, as those other guys because he plays more of an end position most of the time, it seems like. And they're not really counting on him to stop the run as a primary line of defense. He seems to be their cleanup guy. Uh, as much as anything, he's just kind of getting through the wash and, and almost playing a linebacker type role from a, a, a defensive line position. That sounds kind of weird, but I think if, if you watch closely what he does on a typical run play, I, I think it'll make sense. To really stop the run, it seems like the Packers have to have two of those three guys on the field together, Clark, Adams, or Lancaster. And that means you're either taking Lowry off the field or one of the Smiths. And that is probably a non-starter for Mike Patton. He would rather have Lowry and both of the Smiths out there if he can. Either way, it's concerning. Uh, if you can't stop the run with those guys on the field or, or you have to go personnel groupings where, where they can get on and at the expense of, of maybe a little bit more speed and coverage, which is a, an, an entirely different issue, it's a, it's a problem for the Packers. And this, I don't see any reason why it's going to get markedly better in the near future. They could use 
another stout defender in that front seven, whether it's a lineman or a linebacker. Speaking of linebackers, we've also got this idea that the Packers can't stop tight ends, and I think this is definitely a story to watch as well. Hunter Henry had 10 targets for the Chargers today, the most among Chargers players. Resulted in a 7-catch, 84-yard afternoon for Los Angeles, courtesy of Mr. Henry. Henry. More broadly, the Chargers made just a lot of hay, throwing towards that short middle to short left area of the field to maybe intermediate depth to basically at or near Blake Martinez. We talked about Blake Martinez for almost an entire podcast over the summer. And I made the case that I didn't think the Packers should resign him this season. And games like this, games like we've seen in the past couple of weeks are, are a big reason why. Martinez does a lot of okay to pretty okay things. He gets a lot of tackles about three or four yards downfield. He gets everybody organized. Where's that communications helmet? That's good. But he's a liability in coverage, it seems like, more and more. His lack of overall top-end athleticism is more and more apparent, too. And he just never seems to really make plays on the ball consistently. Last year, he had a handful of sacks, all of them kind of designed pressure specifically for him, where he was basically a free hitter. Even this year, he hasn't, hasn't had anything like that, and he just has never consistently made plays on the ball. This was always the knock on guys against, uh, well, not even guys like, this was always the knock against A.J. Hawk specifically. He had a lot of nice tackle numbers, but it was always way downfield, never made plays in the ball, and he he seemed like a net negative for the defense, and I fear we are getting closer and closer to that territory for Blake Martinez if we haven't gotten there already. Moving along, I think we're going to have more conversation this week about whether or not the Packers are as bad as they seem at wide receiver other than Devontae Adams. And I think this is more story than headline, although it does have a clickbaity sort of feel to it. This one is is not going to improve either. Uh, the Packers have the guys that they have, and they're going to be stuck with these guys. This this week, the Packers threw 10 passes to non-Devontae Adams receivers and generated just 65 yards for their trouble. And other than Alan Lazard, non-Devontae Adams receivers generated just 21 yards on six targets today. That is awful. And this was another thing that Tony Romo pointed out. The Packers don't have guys that can win one-on-one -on -one matchups consistently and quickly. Devontae Adams is the only guy with a quick release off the line. Other than that, you've got a, a lot of guys who take a lot of time to build up speed. Geronimo Allison, long strider, long spindly guy. Alan Lazard, same thing. Jake Kumaro, same thing. Even the one guy with legit deep speed, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, is not some sort of quick, short area burst guy. He's a... A sprinter, a long striding sprinter type. And this is why I advocated this offseason exploring the idea of a more slot type receiver in the draft. The Packers didn't go that route. And that's fine. But we're seeing the problems of building your receiving core all around one body type, I think, this season. And there have been times when this receiving group has been okay. But I think it's never a bad idea to add more talent, and the Packers missed a window to add some talent at the trade deadline. And I think they're going to suffer for it. They don't have guys that win those one-on-one -on -one matchups. You hope Alan Lazard can continue to perform and improve, but this is just not a very deep group of wide receivers, even just expanded out more broadly, just pass catchers in general. Jimmy Graham caught four passes today. I think it was four. All of them, however many he caught, were... Just little dump-off plays. He averaged 4.3 yards per catch today. Yesterday, I guess, technically. Um, 4.3. That is unbelievable for a guy with the physical gifts that he has to diminish though, may, though they may be at this point in his career. 4.3 yards per catch. He might as well just be doing running plays still. The Packers could desperately use some more talent. And I don't see where it's going to come from at this point in the season. Ryan Grant is not the answer. Finally, 
there's going to be a lot of talk about the Packers having issues on the offensive line. And I think this is more headline than story. Uh, while David Bakhtiari continues to have a weird and potentially just flat out bad season, on the whole, I think this has been a good year for the offensive line. There have been problems at times, sure. Problems when the uh, when the Chiefs were blitzing heavily early in the game last week. Problems with Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram this week, although I think it's forgivable to have problems with those guys. This was a bad outing for the offensive line, to be sure. But I think on the whole this season, they've been good as a unit. So maybe up and down individual performances. Bakhtiari, as I mentioned, has not been up to his usual standards. Billy Turner uh, is an adventure week in and week out, though he probably is. If you look at where the Packers have been at right guard over the past couple of seasons, he's probably better than Byron Bell last year and the uh, kind of withered remains of Jaree Evans in 2017. So I think on the whole, they're, they're probably at better shape, in better shape at right guard than they have been, but he is a little bit of an adventure. On the whole, like I said, though, I think this is a, a good offensive line unit, and uh, even if they've had a couple mixed performances the last couple weeks, I still feel, feel pretty good about this group as a whole. So that's headline versus story. What does this loss mean, to put a, put a point on it? What does it mean? Well, it means the Packers are 7-2. and two. That is their record now. There may be no good losses, like I said, up top. But if you're going to lose a game that you should have won, and I still believe that the Packers should have won this game, as well as the Chargers played, the Packers could have played better. And if it, even like an average outing from the Packers probably wins this game. If you're going to lose a game that you should have won, it's best to lose it on a week where everyone else in your division loses. If you can pull that off, you're probably doing okay. And wouldn't you know it, that is exactly what happened for the Packers in this one. If there's any good news coming out of this one, it's that the Packers did not lose any ground in their division because everyone else in the division lost as well. Great banner week for the NFC North. This is why it's good to have that cushion, too, in general. Starting the season 7-1, and one, Let's you drop a game like this and have it not ruin your season. If the Packers, imagine if the Packers were like five and three coming into this one, or yeah, five and three, they had eight games, and this one drops them to five and four, facing a pretty solid Panthers team coming in next week, and then a bye, and then the 49ers the week after that. Chances are you're going to lose one of those two games, betting it's the 49ers one. Um, you're looking at a 500 record just a week after your bye with a little over a month to go in the regular season. I'd much rather go into that one at 7-3 and three at the worst. Even if the Packers drop their next two games, they're still 7-4 and four coming down the stretch in the regular season. Five games to go, 7-4 and four would not be the worst place to be. This is why it is great to start the season as hot as the Packers did this year. What happens next? Like I said, Packers get the Panthers at Lambeau Field. The Panthers beat the Titans 30-20 to today. Kyle Allen has played pretty well this season in relief of Cam Newton, who has very frustrating ongoing foot issues. Uh, frustrating to see just as a fan of football. It's got to be frustrating for him dealing with a recurring injury like that. You really feel for guys who, who go through stuff like that. Uh, but Christian McCaffrey as well, uh, real solid for the Panthers. He's been in the MVP conversation. I think that might be a little bit overhyped, but still, he's been really good. Greg Olson's still a solid tight end at age 57 or 63 or 96 or whatever he is now. And you know what? That's starting to sound a little bit familiar. Solid to good quarterback play, a running back who can make you pay, tight ends who can take advantage of mismatches. Hmm. Might be something to watch for the Packers headed towards Lambeau Field next week. Not going to do the rundown of just the random observations this week. It just doesn't feel right after a game like this one. It's just going to, all. I'm looking at my notes, all the stuff like that that I wanted to talk about isn't fun or interesting at all. It just almost seems, whiny is not the right word, but it, it borders on that. I, I didn't have a, a lot of good positive stuff to talk about. So instead, I will just let you go in this one. 20 minutes is good enough. 20 minutes on a frustrating, irritating loss that you seem to have just once a year at least. Yep, it happens. Bummer. 
we can move on. And we will move on. We'll move on together in this one. That's all I've got for you on this episode. If you like what you heard, leave us a rating and a review in the podcast app of your choice. It's going to help more people find the show, and we just really appreciate it. If you want to take your support to the next level, check us out on Patreon. Patreon.com slash the power sweep. A buck a month helps offset the cost of uh, hosting the show, hosting our website, all of that good stuff. And hey, if you want to throw in more than a dollar a month, we appreciate that as well. If you want to look good while you support us, uh, check out our fine selection of t-shirts and sweatshirts at teespring.com. Sl- click the store link at thepowersweep.com to find your way there. And as always, you can help us out by leaving feedback, uh, questions, thoughts, concerns, whatever, via one of our social media or email outlets. Uh, that helps further our mission of helping everybody become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We will see you next time on Blue 58.